So the first uh, speaker today is Henning Jacobs um, about PostgreSQL and Python. After him, Angus Walton. Are you around? Perfect. You're the second one. Um, Henning, ready to start? Should I take this micro or this one? That micro should be open. Okay. So hello, my name is Henning, and i um, just like to do a brief advertisement for Postgres because I like cute little blue elephants, as you can see. And um, yeah, it's a ma match made in heaven, Postgres and Python. So we all know how to query databases, right? So we use PsychoPG or SQL Alchemy or other tools. But of course, Postgres also speaks Python, so this is awesome. And if you don't know stored procedures yet, you should check it out because it's uh, awesome to write uh, stuff on the Postgres server with Python. This is just a simple example here. So uh, we can have any Python code as our body of the SQL function. Um, we can import any Python module. So here is a random module. And uh, we just specify the PL Python language here. And yeah, we can um, call this function just like a normal uh, SQL function. So PL Python is just another language. So we can also write uh, JavaScript on Postgres or PL PGSQL or some other languages. Um, but of course, who wants to do, uh, write JavaScript if you have Python? And um, yeah, the SQL script just contains Python code. Um, you can use any Python module, so you can use the full Python power on the Postgres server side. Um, so it's just some real world examples. So um, all our database servers, of course, have a really cool API, which is SQL. So why not exploit it to get, for example, monitoring data or metrics? So for example, all our database servers at Zalando have some um, utility functions deployed, uh, which use Python, for example, to get server connections. So just listing server connections. And as you uh, will use SQL for any queries or monitoring anyway, you can just uh, call this function. How does it look like? We just define a function, get server connections, and then use some Python code. Of course, it's much longer, but just to showing you, uh, we can do anything here, just uh, reading the proc file system and uh, returning the result. And um, that's why PL Python also has this U in its name, because it's untrusted. So we can do anything as a Postgres user. Um, this uh, requires super user privileges to roll out this function, but anybody can call this function. So you can do nasty stuff, but also very useful stuff here. Um, another example we have, um, so Postgres has a very cool data type JSON, so um, you don't actually need MongoDB or something like that. Uh, you can just uh, store uh, everything relational, and if you really need uh, like schema-less, which is never really schema-less, you can do it in, in this JSON column. And if you really want to validate something um, and have a li little bit more strictness, um, for example, in our case, um, we have a trigger and validate this uh, JSON field to uh, comply with our own type system, which is pretty elaborate and, um, yeah, leaving out everything here, but um, using all Python's expressiveness to validate and using lists and digs and whatever. Yeah, and um, in the end, Python is cool, Postgres is cool, so you might get an elephant in a Zalando package or something. Thanks. To everybody standing there, if you're not finding free seats, the next room over there, we're streaming everything that's happening in here to there. If you can find a seat there, that might be a bit more comfortable. Um, there. Yeah. Shlomo, are you around? I've seen you just a few seconds ago. There you are. You're next. So uh, the next talk is uh, Angus Walton, called Facebook. Okay, good. <clears throat> Wait. So how do I mirror this? Set it up the mirror and if you can change the resolution to 1280 to 720. Mm -hmm. Fine. Good. You ready? So, one sec. 
Yeah, now I'm ready. All right, let's go. Yep. So, hi, I'm Ingus. I'm from Ireland and living in Stuttgart. I work as a back-end web developer. And like uh, <clears throat> Thomas, um, Thomas Waldman yesterday, who also lives in Stuttgart, uh, just a quick mention, I also uh, made a little DIN DNS uh, replacement, if you want to check that out. Uh, it's nice and easy, requires no setup. You can just sign up and uh, curl to update your IP. And yeah, a couple of thousand people seem to find it useful already, so you might as well. So what was I talking about? Uh, Facebook. So we all know what Facebook is, yeah. I don't have to explain that. Um, <clears throat> a little while ago, there was a little um, kind of consternation in the Python community when they dropped support for their uh, Python client for the Graph API. Um, and so I started looking into it, and I found that the Graph API itself is actually rather nice, and you don't really need a client, so to speak, to to use it. So I, do, I was just using essentially requests and playing around with it. But I decided to uh, play a little further and make a tiny little client. <clears throat> we'll see how it works in a second. So it's only a couple of, well, 150 lines of code, and it's designed to be friendly to the developer and help them kind of navigate and interact with the Facebook graph, uh, while also trying to keep HTTP requests to a minimum. So let's see how this goes. Um, you import a client. This is going to be interesting because uh, I'm actually live programming and also accessing a remote service. So this is definitely going to go wrong. But anyway, uh, so let's say you get a node on the Facebook graph. So that's going to be me. So you see here, uh, me name is Angus Walton and so on. Now, at the moment, it just looks like a normal JSON response, so it's like a dictionary. But if you actually check the type, it's actually a Facebook node. What that means is that <clears throat> Facebook has gone through and recursively uh, turned all of the other nodes into uh, Facebook nodes. So we can see that if we look at, for example, my hometown, which is Dublin. I can You, you see it's a normal, normal dictionary there. It's a subclass of dic dictionary. But I can check the check-ins to Dublin, and it makes another get request and automatically updates. And now we have an awful lot more information about my hometown. So that's stored and cached. Uh, you can also, um, yeah, so I mean, uh, profiles are, are nodes, uh, pages are nodes, um, you know, even posts and comments are nodes. So I can essentially post a comment to, well, a status update. Uh, Uh, <laughs> and I need to uh, specify the privacy. Uh, I can show you that later. That's simply a little dictionary just saying, I just want to show it to myself. Um, and I'll also assign that to uh, status. So I post a little status update. And if we check my Facebook profile, um, there we go. There it is. <clears throat> And so we can also do stuff like then. You see, I, I, I posted it to me, yeah? So if I do something like this, I can go post to the status and uh, say something like, uh, uh, so the typical Facebook comment, basically. <laughs> and yeah, that should be it. So now I have a comment, and it's also stored uh, in the comment, and it's already updated. You can also do cool stuff like you can simply like the comment. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good comment. And you can see, I, I've liked it, yeah? You can, <clears throat> and, and so on. So I mean, it's essentially, it's just a really nice way of kind of exploring the graph and also interacting with it. Um, there's some other stuff. Uh, let's see, what else can I do? Yeah, exactly. Um, one last thing, if I try to like my hometown, because that's also a Facebook node, it'll error out because the app that I've created in Facebook uh, f to use the API, which is called M Mark Zuckerberg, my hero, uh, <laughs> is uh, not allowed to those permissions. So we have a nice little exception error here. So, check it out. HDMI. Let's see. 
the next one after Shlomo will be Tomer uh, Chachamu. Was that? All right. And Shlomo is going to talk about uh, the YAML reader. Is it the DVI? HTMI. Yeah. Resolution And by the way, if you run Linux and are fed up with messing with the resolutions, I wrote a tool called Auto Mirror that does that at a that's your, push that's your, button. That's on your time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, YAML reader. It's about modularized configuration made easy. Um, I'm working at Immobilien Scout 24 here in Berlin. Well. One common problem we face is we install a software and it brings a configuration file that looks like that. It sees something conf and some information. Nice if it's in YAML, often not, but I don't care. The problem is, if I want to change that, basically the only way to do that is patching it. And in our world, patching is kind of ugly and not nice and it's difficult to check and verify and so on. And I said in my previous talk, we don't need Puppet because it solves a problem we don't have. And the reason we don't have it is what I'm showing you here. So, how do we solve this problem? Well, we change the software, or we ask it to be changed, or we write a patch or a wrapper, whatever, that changes the configuration to be modularized. Modularized means instead of a single configuration file, we have a directory with a lot of configuration files in it. And the first one, usually something like default YAML 00 default to have it sorted early in the alphabet, looks like the previous one, which has the default configuration. And that comes obviously from some upstream software package. Now, we just add another configuration file that comes in later and contains only the things we want to have changed. Comes from our package, and as you can see, no patching necessary because we have a different file which can be owned by a different RPM package. The way how this works is really simple. We wrote a little thing called YAML Reader, which is a Python library, which will take a directory or a collection of YAML files and merge them into a single YAML file or dict. And the way how it does the merging is probably exactly the same how your mother would expect it to happen. How do you use it? Very simple. Instead of writing the usual import YAML and save load, open, whatever, you just import YAML load from the YAML reader library and you do YAML load on the YAML plugin directory. That's all. That's the only change you need to do to your, configura to your software where it reads the configuration. There are several ways how to use it. You can still give it a single file and you save all the open stuff because that's really not interesting. You can give it a directory, you can give it a wildcard, whatever, star.conf, star.yaml, or you can just give it a list of files. You can also give it an initial set of configuration, like a kind of built-in configuration. And I would advise you all to start modularizing your configuration because it makes your life much simpler. If you want to look at other things we do, check out these addresses. YAT is our open source deployment and orchestration solution. It includes a configuration management that works through RPM packages. And a lot of other open source stuff can be found on our GitHub account. Here's the obvious pitch. Yes, we're hiring. And if you are interested in automation or like to make the world surrounding you more simple, then please approach us, talk to us. We have a lot of interesting things to do. Thank you very much. Uh, Josef Heinen, are you around? Excellent, you would be next. And this talk is Toma is that yep. is that correct? All right, thanks. Is that the picture or is that <laughs> could be simulation or something? It's clays. <laughs> is it 
this is getting cold. No. Should we try that? Oh, there's another one. <laughs> I have a Mac, unfortunately. Tommy, I'm here to talk to you about seeking and compressed files for fun and profit. So at my work, we've got a lot of log files, um, so many that I couldn't get an accurate number. And we need to compress them and just sometimes look inside. So say I used gzip, um, it compresses, but it compresses it all in one go. So say I need to look at something that happened at 11 PM, and I've got the, the entire day in one file. Um, I'd have to go through the whole file, which takes a whole minute, and I'm very impatient. So the solution is XZ. You can tell XZ to split the file into different blocks, and then if you want to read a small part of the file, you can just skip to roughly the right area and find the information you're looking for. Sorry about the uh, disco-style presentation. <laughs> it also... Um, it also compresses a bit better, although it's a bit slower. Uh, but the problem is there wasn't any library that let you actually use this functionality. It was just part of the file format. Um, Python 3 has a library for XZ files, which is called LZMA. So I modified it to add the functionality, and I called it LZMA FFI. So this is how you get it. And once you've installed it, it's just like using a normal Python file. You can call read and seek. And you can also write files with it. So in this example, I'm skipping to the end of the file, and it only takes uh, half a second, and then can read part of the file. You can also open files for writing, and then if you call the flush method, you can put blocks wherever you like. So say have a logging daemon, and you want to put it uh, a new block every minute, then you can do that. So that's the fun, but what about the profit? Unfortunately, according to XKCD, I haven't actually profited, but uh, now that I've written the library, you can all use it and profit. So uh, there you go. Um, here are some of the other libraries that read this file format for Python. And uh, what I've also added is I use CFFI, which means that PyPy's JIT can optimize code that uses it. So I'm going to... Hopefully, it can be part of the uh, PyPy distribution when they're targeting 3.3 compatibility. Uh, here's the, if you think it's going to be useful, you can get it in pip. And if you find any awful bugs, then you can talk to me on GitHub. Thanks. The next one after Joseph will be Zbigniew Zichyarz. <laughs> I, I have a terrible job right now. I... I'm not. <laughs> okay. Okay. You ready? Okay. All right. Excellent. Joseph. Okay, I'm going to tell you something about a MIDI player I have written in Python, and maybe that's kind of cool stuff. Uh, 
I did it in my private time and it may not be related, it's not related to my work, so I don't know whether it's useful for you or not, but uh, I just was interested if it would be possible to write such a software uh, in poor Python. And the result is a Python script which is uh, less than 1400 lines of code and it's uh, capable of reading standard MIDI files and send them uh, to MIDI devices and while it's uh, giving a lot of visual feedback about the file information and what it's doing. Uh, what it's doing. Uh, it has no module dependencies, so it's very easy to install. The only dependency is BioOpenGL, which is used for the graphical user uh, display. It's a WYSIWY app. My, maybe you never heard about this, but it's, it, it's really, you can really hear what, what you see. Uh, it's, uh, it's not so easy. We'll see it later when I demonstrate it. Uh, it has been tested on stage, so forget about TDD. Uh, I've been a hobby musician uh, a lot of years ago, and I used this software on an um, MS-DOS computer for over 10 years, and it uh, ran very, very uh, stable. It's very resource-friendly, so it cannot be used, uh, for example, to heat uh, your office in Finland, uh, which we heard yesterday. And uh, as I said, it has no innovative features, but uh, it simply works, uh, because it responds, it responds in real time, and... Uh, in the order of milliseconds, and that's not an uh, easy job for a Python script. Uh, by the way, it, it provides a very nice looking uh, mixer interface with transport controls and a lot of uh, other options you can uh, change during the play uh, of the playing time of the MIDI file. It also supports keyboard shortcuts, which is relict of um, the usage when I was a hobby musician because if you are a guitarist, you don't have a hand to, to, to use a mouse or something like this. And it shows a lot of information, runs on, on, on all uh, popular systems, and the, the trick is that it uses texture blitting to guarantee the highest refresh rates and responsiveness. So at this point, I can show you a picture how it looks like, uh, but I think it's now time to show you a demo. Okay. Hopefully you can see it here, yes. Maybe you can't hear enough. Uh, he has just loaded a MIDI file, and as you can see here, is, he is uh, adjusting all the knobs. Uh, you can change the volume as you like. You can switch off uh, single channels and you have a lot of control over what is uh, sent to the MIDI device. In this case, I send it to the internal uh, DLS. And normally, you connect an external device. Uh, here you can see that you can use keyboard shortcuts, for example, just to hear the drums. It's a little bit, okay, we can't hear it because there's no audio connection. Uh, you can change the, the speed. You can sh slow it down. You can change the, the key. You can change everything online and it all works in Python. So let's, now you can hear the drums only, you can hear the bass only, you can hear the guitars only, and these are all very single shortcuts which you can use with only one hand. So if you are a guitar player or a keyboard player, you can use it on stage. And so this was just an attempt uh, to see whether Python is capable of doing such things. Thank you. Martin Gross, Martin Gross, with you? All right, excellent. Okay. Can you introduce yourself? That would be really nice. Yeah, okay, so my name is Zbigniew Sitas. Zbigniew? Yeah. All right. 
and I will be talking, uh, this will be a short talk about Python 3 only code base, especially in the case of Django, what are the benefits, what are the perks of using Python 3. Uh, as I said, I'm Zbigniew, uh, you can find me on the internet, uh, um, mostly as ZCJAR or on my home site, I work for uh, Golden Line. This is the biggest uh, business social network in Poland. And we have lots of legacy code, lots of Python legacy code. Let's not talk about it. We are early adopters, we are cool kids, and we build a new project. We build new projects with Python 3.4, with Django 1.7, etc., etc. Uh, one small disclaimer the things I'll be talking may be obvious to some of you. But still, it feels good to finally be able to use them after years of watching with envy from Python 2 trenches. First of all, we begin our source files with this comment. In Python 2, the default encoding for files was ASCII. In Python 3, the default is UTF-8. Remove it. The next thing, you probably have your files sprinkled with those future imports, with division, print function, absolute imports, unicode literals. This is all unnecessary, remove it. Super, I love super, and super is very useful in Django, very, very much used in Django. When you are overriding forms, models, class-based views, super is everywhere. But you have to type the name of the class, you have to type self, when you rename the class, you need to remember to rename it also in the super calls. You don't need it. In Python 3, it works with just the parentheses. Another language feature in Python 3.3 and upwards is yield from, which is awesome. Uh, there were better examples of yield from, but I will look for some uh, most Django-ish one. And you could do with either tools, but it's cool not to use them. Another very awesome discovery, Fault Handler. It's a very small library which usually you should use only these two lines of code. And if your process seg faults, now you have a traceback and not just segmentation fault, end of output. You don't need to, to have mock in your requirements txt file. Just use the standard library. Replace pip install mock. Don't ever call pip install mock. You can have async I.O., it's the new big thing in Python world, but I actually haven't played it with it yet, but there's a nice demo by uh, Aymeric Augustin who put together a kind of research project with Django, with web workers, uh, web sockets, and uh, async I.O. And there's one final bonus feature with Python 3. It's harder to accidentally use MySQL, thank you. Isaac Bernard, are you around? Excellent, you will be next. Under that, other side. No, I need a, a big display port or a PGA stand. Yeah. That's okay. So, yes, we see something. If it's not crashing. Okay, so hi, my name is Martin. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself if not everything is going. Well, it crashed, fine. But still, you can see what I'm talking about. So my name is Martin. Some people might perhaps know me from the Chaos Computer Club. Uh, I'm the guy at the info desk. But when I'm not doing the info desk, I am with the ACAP team. ACAP uh, in German, it's called All Colors It's Be Are Beautiful. It's a project that the Chaos Computer Club Munich has done in the past and we're doing it here again on the Euro Python. If you go downstairs, you might have seen that big uh, wally thing that looks something like this. Um, in fact, it's not just there to look beautiful, it's also for you here to play. And what I'm here today is to just show you very, very quick what this thing is about and how you can use it. Because it would really be a shame if it's just standing there and nobody is using it. So basically the technical details before we get into Python, um, it's a three watt RGB LED with a self-designed PCB. In fact, the one that you're seeing here on the slides isn't the one that we are using. The one that we're using is blue, but except from that, it's basically the same. Um, they're connected and uh, they're speaking IPv6, but for your convenience, we made an IPv4 gateway for you. 
So uh, you see there's a lot of technical stuff going inside, but uh, the important stuff for you is that we have um, um, a Python library that you can use. Going to do that a little bit faster. We have a library that is called ACAP SL, which you can download from GitHub. Our repository is MuC3 ACAP Street Life, and there it's in the branch EuroPython. Basically, what you do, you check out the library, and then you are faced with a lot of uh, files. The first thing that you want to do if you want to develop your own animations is to start a simulation, which will just give you here like this a blank or black window. Then, just to get into it, go in the animations directory and play, for example, the one an animation is called screw. If you play it back, it, sorry, uh, I just changed that so we can use it on the real wall. My fail. So, you can see you have a little uh, script that shows what your animation actually looks like. When you've done developing your own animations, you can also play them back on the wall downstairs. It's really easy. You just have to pr uh, provide the, the script with some parameters that you can find in the, um, in the GitHub. It's basically you provide the IP address and the port where you want to play back to. So just let's get quickly inside the code. For example, we are going to open the doppelblitz.py file. Um, you see we are providing like almost anything that you can use to get started really, really fast. The central point is you import rcapsl basically, and then you have here one command, the acapsl send and acapsl update. With send, it's basically, you just provide a coordinate, it's x and y, a RGB value, here, what we're doing here with zero is the fade time because the uh, lamps are actually quite intelligent. They can fade themselves to a specific color. If you just say, okay, just go there without any fading, set it to zero, and the number of the wall, set it to one, or just use the value here from uh, ACAP SL number of walls, and you will be fine to go. So you just call that for every single coordinate you want to change and send an update, and once you have it updated, it just displays on the wall. So that's just a really quick introduction. Um, I guess everyone from you can work with that code. If there are any questions, you can come downstairs and see me or my, from some of my colleagues. We are downstairs here, where you can just try to work with the wall and make some creative animations. Uh, we also have, like for example, people who already developed with the wall. They created some games, like for example, Snake, that could be played uh, with your cell phone. You can do almost whatever you want, and if you wrote some cool code, send us a pull request, and we can integrate it directly on the wall so other people can use it without having to run it on their own laptops. Thanks. Alex Wilmer. Alex Wilmer? Perfect. Excellent. That's awesome. Um, Isaac Burnett is the next. He's going to talk about Pycrastinate. He wants to do... More to do less. Damn it. Uh. Okay, we're good to go. You good? So uh, this is a piece of software I first presented at uh, PyCon Sweden a couple of months ago, but unfortunately there was no recording equipment, so now I'm going to reduce it into a lightning talk format. So having said uh, this, you can check the other slides and the original documentation if you go on my GitHub repo, and you can also grab me around here. So uh, I will talk about the tool and some real use cases where you can use it. And because I don't know if I will be able to talk everything in five minutes, I will start by the end, the conclusions, which are the most important. First of all, with this tool, what you can do is you can search around your code base, grab your to-dos, fix me, hacks, and all these things you want to get rid of, and it actually makes it easier for you. For example, creating a report, sending automatic emails, or some other information we will see. Why would you like to use it? First of all, it's convenient. You don't have to change any way how you're coding. It works with legacy code. It not only works with Python, it works virtually with anything you would code. Secondly, uh, you don't need any weird setup. You just clone the GitHub repo or get it from pip. And uh, the only dependency is Python 2 or Python 3. 
If you are here, you probably already have Python in your computers. Uh, modularity, it's really easy to extend. There are lots of modules available, but you can just implement your own. And finally, it's, I would say, quite fast. Here I tested with Django because it's a very big and reputable project most of us know. And it took less than three and a half seconds to the analysis, going through 250,000 Python lines. And uh, I found more than 60 to do's in the code base. What surprised me, it's because this is a very reputable and very used uh, code base. There were more than 20 of them that they were five years old. But you don't have to believe me. I can actually demonstrate here. You just run it with a configuration file. And yeah, here you get a simple report. This is the default report on the console. So there are more fancy HTML and Markdown modules. Here you see that the uh, results are aggregated by the token type to do. There was a fix me for. And here I aggregated them by the author name. But you can aggregate them by date or by file name or by any other parameter you want. And here you can see these are some of the tokens that were gathered. And this is the order that it's followed here. So let's go and talk about the tool. The tool basically is a pipeline. Pipeline means that it's some function that generates some output, and this is taken by the next function. And I divided them in several different steps. You don't need to use them all. You can add more of them. So first of all, you need to gather files. This means that uh, you will detect and decide which files you're going to investigate. For example, this could be as easy as selecting a few file extensions in a repo. Uh, secondly, you want to inspect files. In our case, you would like to see all to the comments. Then you can extract more metadata, for example, the daytime that it was produced, and maybe you want to filter some of it. For example, if one of my developers is on vacation, I maybe don't want to bug him with bugs and emails saying, hey, you have some broken code base to, to see. Here are the trigger actions. You could send these to a dashboard. Or, for example, if it's something very serious, you could raise an exception and break the continuous integration so somebody immediately fixes it. Then you can aggregate the results so it's easier to, to, to deal with them, create a report, create a file, and uh, yeah. Uh, this is implementation detail because most, most of the things are lazily evaluated. You have to process the results in the end. This is how the, how the configuration file looks. So you have all the functions and the, a uh, number which is the priority and will, in which they will be executed. I use this format instead of simple list because you can merge different dictionaries and still get the result you want. And here there are some of the examples of the information and parameters you could fit. You don't need to fit them all. There are lots of that are default and they are not included here. So three use cases. One of them could be take control. You want to take control of fixmes. So basically you would find the fixmes and yeah, uh, you want to, you, you, for example, want to filter out the ones that are very recent. If something is bro broken and in production, maybe it's good to make a, co a quick hack and just put it there. But if it's there for a long time, you don't want your code base to depend on it. So this would be uh, how uh, the function to remove these, these cases you don't want. And yeah, here you have a couple of more use cases. This is only the, the only code you need. You don't need any more code. And I'm going through it very fast, but you can search them on GitHub, uh, Isaac Bernard dash Pycrastinate. This is how the HTML reports will look. Here, if you click on thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. Radek Jankovic, are you around? Radek, excellent, you will be next. Alex Wilmer is now, yep. Okay. That's interesting. <laughs> Should that scare me? No, just get a laugh. All right, start. Okay, hi, my name is Alex Wilmer. I'm here to, call, talk, here to talk about an app called Chirp, which is a way of say, sending and sharing data using sound. Um, the way it works is you've two random people that have met in, a, met in the park and um, one of you's taken a photo and you'd like to share it with the other. You, you don't have emails, addresses, you don't have any common secrets. But if you're both running this app, which by the way, is not my app, it's just something to use as a base, then you can 
play a chirp. And if the other device is listening, that will decode that chirp into a URL, and then it can download whatever it is you want to share. You can share URLs, um, photos, bits of text, all sorts of things. Now, the, the problem with this app is if you've got an iPhone or an Android, you're, you're sorted. Anything else is a bit of a problem at the moment. Um, it, is a, it is a proprietary application. It is partially documented, but not totally. Um, so what I've been able to do is reverse engineer a bit of it so that you can chirp with Python. Um, the way you do this is to make an HTTP request to the chirp.io servers. Um, it's a fairly simple thing. You send it a lump of JSON and you get a lump of JSON back. The long code that you see at the bottom is, the complete, is a textual representation of the complete chirp. And the short code is the actual data, that's the payload, and that's what makes the URL that the person sharing can download with. Um, once you've actually got this long code, if you want to play it, then uh, there is a, the, a very experimental chirp, uh, the chirp module that you can download from GitHub, uh, basically initialize Pygame, and then send a chirp, and any device that works with Pygame and can run Python can now chirp. Uh, for any of the amateur radio buffs or audio engineers in the audience, the way chirp works is there are 32 notes that can be played. Each of those encodes five bits. Um, you play 10 notes and you've got 50 bits of resolution. Um, the part that is not implemented yet is Reed Solomon encoding, um, which is the, how the error correction works. And um, if anybody is good with finite field arithmetic or Reed Solomon encoding, please talk to me because I would love your input. Um, if you want to read more about the technicalities, there is chirp.io is the homepage for the application forward slash tech is the documentation that they provide. Um, if you would like to download the Python code, then it is at github um, moriarty slash chirp pi. If you'd like to contact me, I am moriarty on Twitter. Um, and finally, if you would like to just chirp from your browser, then... Bear with me one second. That one, can I drag you? Oh dear. Ah, there we go. So if you would like to chirp from your browser, I've, there is a bookmarklet that you can drag into there. And if you go to any website, you can then chirp that website from your browser. Thank you very much. <laughs> One final word of warning, if you do download the Chirp app, don't leave it running in the background. It will beep randomly, even if your phone is on silent. <laughs> Thank you. Simon Cross. Excellent. You're the one after it? Hello everyone, uh, a word about me. Uh, my name is uh, Radek Jankiewicz and I, uh, I work for uh, 
a Python uh, company from Poland, STX Next, uh, and that's basically everything you should know about me. Uh, today I would like to uh, present you a way uh, how we uh, are trying to uh, avoid with our colleagues to fall into routine with everyday uh, tasks and so on. Uh, so we, we, we're, uh, we're organizing uh, our internal company uh, hackathon events uh, where we can do stuff that, we, that, that is really fun for us and we can use technologies that we are not likely to use uh, in our everyday work. Uh, so we, we already made a, a short, uh, simple JavaScript game, a mobile app that uh, can, uh, can, can count the number of steps you take uh, based on the measurements from uh, mobile uh, accelerometer. And, but today I would like to tell you uh, more about the recent, uh, our recent event where we were playing uh, poker. Uh, well, actually, uh, we were playing uh, our algorithm. Algorithms were playing poker. Uh, we prepared a, a dealer application and, and, and player application. And uh, the dealer application is, is, is asking uh, the, the player applications. Uh, and uh, the decision uh, is made by the algorithm. Each player can, can uh, code. Uh, a few words uh, about the dealer application. It's, it's just a, a pyramid application. Uh, you can find uh, the source, basically even a build out uh, on the GitHub. It runs with Python 3.3. Uh, and the one thing that was quite difficult was a poker uh, hand uh, evaluation algorithm. Uh, and I, I found uh, one on, on GitHub uh, done by Mr. Alian. Alian G. Uh, he was, he was uh, actually, uh, he, he, he based on, on, on another algorithm that, that you can find in the net that was uh, uh, originally written in, in C, but I, I re really recommend to take a look at it. It is quite a, a brilliant idea of how to, how to evaluate uh, the poker hand. Uh, the player application is just uh, a small uh, server written in pure Python with the WSG, uh, uh, WSG server from standard library. Uh, you also can, can uh, get the source from, uh, from GitHub. Uh, that's how, how the game looks like. I can uh, present you uh, a live demo. Yeah. Uh, so here's the, here's the table, the, the first, the first uh, game. By pressing space key, I can uh, ask each uh, another player. Mm, player with number three has a strong card, so he will be playing uh, tough, I think. Let's see. Oh, he's got a <laughs> four aces at hand, so he's actually a, a winner. Yeah, so the guy with nothing has uh, passed. Fold it. Uh, okay. And basically, that's it. That that that, that are we uh, having fun playing, playing, uh, and challenging our algorithms. Uh, and by the way, uh, there is another another uh, event uh, organized by one of our of, of my colleague from the company. He's uh, he's uh, preparing a Euro Python battle, which is uh, a game called Grot. When you when your algorithm can also take take uh, part into in, in, in this competition uh, check out the the europythonbattle.com or uh, go to the uh, stand of uh, stx next below thank you sebastian kraft is he here excellent Just have a look. Yeah. 
Hi, I'm Simon, and I'm here to try and convince you to come to PyCon South Africa. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, and PyCon Finland set a high standard, but anyway, here goes. So, why should you come? Well, things we invented. Ubuntu. <laughs> which is Linux even your grandfather can use. Um, I'm not sure if everyone knows, but Amazon EC2 was also started in Cape Town, um, and that's somewhere to SSH2. <laughs> um, because we had already written one cloud service, we decided to do another one, so we also wrote one for Oracle, and that has absolutely nothing to do with IRC. Um, so not only are we good at clouds, um, but we also have the Milky Way in the right place where you can see it. <laughs> um, we're building the world's largest radio telescope, um, which currently looks like that. Um, there are a lot more dishes to be built. And what's more, we're doing it in Python. <laughs> Actually, even some of the high throughput data processing is done in Python. Um, we developed some cool stuff to read data straight from uh, using DMA straight into NumPy arrays, um, straight from the network card. So that's cool. Um, we also do some less big things. Um, we ported Matplotlib to Python 3, or at least um, we kind of broke the back of it and did a bunch of the work during a sprint. Um, we also, some people in South Africa also did Matplotlib HTML5 canvas. Uh, we recently did a sprint to write Pygame CFFI um, so that your games can be fast. Uh, we take part in Pi Week. Um, it's a bit of a habit. Um, perhaps we take part more often um, than these are some of our games. <laughs> um, it's strictly healthy, but it is a lot of fun. Um, and many of these games now run under Pi Game CFFI. So just a little plug. Um, if you right, have a Pi Game, try it under Pi Game CFFI. Fix the things that you find. So attend. <laughs> Um, we're friendly. Um, speak. Uh, we're still especially looking for a few big name speakers if anyone's interested in coming out our way and meeting us and saying hello. Um, but even if you're not a big name speaker, um, we really just like to hear from people far away. Um, a sponsor. Um, there's still a few sponsorship slots open, and it's really cheap because our currency is not that strong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is where you find us. <laughs> um, yeah, just go straight south. <laughs> um, yeah. um, if you run out of continent, you've probably gone too far. Uh, these are the details. Uh, the website's za.pycon.org. It's the 2nd and 3rd of October. Um, it's this year, and you can follow us um, on Twitter at, at PyConZA. And lastly, just a quick thank you to all of the people who've already sponsored us. Oh, thank you. Gautier Mayon, are you around? Yes. Excellent. I do have to ask a question anyway. Um, the numbers that I got from who wants to participate in sprints uh, was kind of confusing between yesterday and today. So, once more, um, can everybody who is planning to attend the sprints or the bar camp stand up for one second? Okay, it should work now. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, um, you guys down there, can you make noise or something? Oh, that was something. <laughs> that was one guy. All right, okay. Um, that looks good to me. Thank you. Um, just to inform you, um, you can still come if you make up your mind later. It's just we need to kind of schedule how much food we'll have. Um, if there are substantially more people than we have initially planned for food, you just need to wait a little bit longer. We're going to be refurbished the uh, buffet, but it might be a little edgy. So just, just come if you want to. Don't feel excluded just by not having stand up here. Are you getting ready? Can we skip one? Like, yeah, we can skip one, can. sure. Um, I would even, are you around tomorrow? I would suggest you try again tomorrow. I can put you on the list for that. After that? All right, okay. Um, anyway, just if that has to skip again, Peter Kopatz, um, are you there? What is my presentation? Excellent. Start walking. Ah. Oh, lovely. <laughs> That's the conclusion. Gautier, you ready? Yes. All right, start. Um, so I'm Gautier Yin. I work at Fryer T in London. And a couple of months back, I wanted to upgrade my laptop to the latest Ubuntu. Uh, so the way you do it is you uh, run do release upgrade. But uh, I got an error. Uh, not that one. <laughs> oh, damn it. Really? Uh, I guess that's the, this one. Damn it, no, it's not. It's, uh, it died. I can, I can just talk to it, it's fine. Yes, uh, so, uh, S trace. Um, <laughs> the idea is um, you can, um, you can run your program with S trace and it will, uh, it will uh, show all the uh, system calls that it is uh, executing. So you can see every file that your program is opening, or closing, or the, all the network activity, all the, the, the things you're reading from files, or writing to files. So it's very convenient, um, but it has one issue, which is uh, it produces a lot of output. So you've got a, a lot of uh, file being open, usually, or read, or uh, network activity. And if you want to find what went wrong in your uh, program, the, uh, there is a process for it. So you start at the end of the output, and then you go backwards until you find your error. And once you've got your error, then you can actually look uh, very carefully at what's going on. So you can find what the actual issue is. And when you find the issue, you will, uh, it's a bit annoying, because it will, it will actually show you something very uh, explicit, it will say to you which file it is opening, and if it's something like a, not a normal file, or if it's a file that shouldn't be opened, you will understand that uh, that was the issue, and therefore you can just uh, fix that issue and, and get back to work, basically. Um, so yeah, so as trace, you should use it, because it's very good to uh, understand what goes wrong in your programs. Thank you. Um, after Peter, uh, Tomek Pachkowski, are you around? Excellent, you will be next. Two days ago, uh, 
Federico uh, has held a tutorial about Blender, and uh, there was a huge uh, interest in this program, and there also uh, remains uh, some questions. One question I will answer in short. Um, uh, it is difficult to use uh, Blender in the first place. Um, like uh, BI or Emacs, uh, how many users use uh, VI? Raise your hand. Uh, okay, and the under, other party, uh, Emacs users? Okay. Uh, uh, you, you know, you remember this uh, difficulties, uh, the same happens uh, with Blender, and I will give you a short uh, insights uh, that uh, I like. Uh, so off the, often the windows are split uh, by accident and this happens when you uh, come with the mouse uh, over this uh, triangle and there's no closing button uh, like in other windows. And it's, uh, if you know it's uh, really easy, uh, go to the same point, uh, the triangle, and uh, drag uh, the pointer to this window uh, that you want to close. And uh, you get rid of this uh, window. Um, this is not possible if you try to close this uh, window on the right side. Uh, they have to be uh, the same. Uh, have to have the same uh, size. Um, and another uh, uh, feature is uh, to switch from the windows. You can have many windows in this program uh, to the uh, full window uh, with control um, arrow, and you can uh, go back to. Uh, the window overview, uh, you have to control this, um, the mouse pointer where is it is placed uh, to get to the right window. We're using uh, Blender in uh, PyMove 3D, a, pro a project uh, to uh, teach uh, children uh, to learn Python. And um, I will show you some examples in the end. Um, this is a an example uh, for generating molecules. Um, Joren has uh, assisted me with his uh, knowledge uh, as a chemistrist, um, and you can uh, run a script uh, with a very small at this moment. This alt-p or run script, and in the dry day view, you can uh, watch your um, your objects. I have prepared here uh, five uh, objects. Let's do this. Is a, a water molecule. Uh, let's try a DNA or a part of a DNA. Oh, this is number two, two in my list. Run again. Let's take some seconds. And there is the DNA, and you can watch your objects. Um, and this is an example for teachers uh, for chemistry, and we like to. Um, create more such examples, and you can join us um, at the Sprint on Friday, no, Tuesday, Saturday. Saturday. Okay, that's all, thanks. All right, so it looks like Sebastian has sorted out his screen. Atomic, you're, that's you, right? All right.
Okay. All right, start. My name is Sebastian Kreff, and I'm presenting GitLint, a tool for improving the source code one step at a time. And let's start with a quick demo. So let's say you have a, an existing code base and you want to start enforcing a, a stricter or like a new coding standard. And so, but like modifying and fixing all the pre-existing code, it's like impossible and it doesn't make much sense. So instead, uh, I present this tool to, to make these changes incrementally. So let's say I have like this uh, small commit. I modify the decimal module in the standard library and I also added a new icon. So typically developers would run pep8 or pylint, whatever standard you defined. So let's see what pylint says about this module. There are like 800 of like these messages and like the, the situation doesn't improve when you, when you run pep8, you have like 180 messages. So if you modify a line, uh, all like possible uh, problems these tools are gonna find are probably gonna be shadowed by the pre-existing error. So let's see how my change looks like. So I only modify one line with a, pre, a pretty obvious like a spacing error and finding that error in that amount of code, it's virtually impossible. So let's see what the tool says. So here like we really can see really easily like first the output of PyLint and second the output of uh, Pep8, both complaining about the, the extra, the, the lacking space. And also we have um, the output for like the PNG these two tools are saying that we can losslessly, losslessly compress the, this file like for like 30% with the second tool. So let's fix this, uh, these problems. And okay, so I optimize the PNG and also uh, fix the Python file. Uh, so let's try to commit. So it's running the pre-commit hook, linting the, the big file. Filing takes a while, so let's wait. Eventually it's gonna finish. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Okay, yeah, it says okay. And for the second icon, it's still complaining because the other tool still can like shrink the file by 4%. And, and you still can commit it if you like skip the pre-commit hook. And let's go back to the end. So this tool like run many linters, reports error only on the modify lines and modify files. It catches the results, so when PyLint is really slow, like you run it again and you're gonna get the results right away. Reorder the results by line and, and also like normalize the message of different tools like in a, and in a uniform way. It's quite extensible. It comes with a pre-commit hook and it's really easy to integrate with um, code review tools. Uh, it comes with support for Python, Java, PHP, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, HTML, CSS, SCSS, JPEG, PNG, REST, JSON, YAML, INI, and if you want to use it, go pip install gitlint or go to my GitHub. And if you are using Mercurial uh, and you want to, to port it, it, it should be really easy. It's just a module ex uh, exposing some common access to the underlying data. That's it. So the next one is Tomek, right? Yep. And then Ola and Ola. Excellent. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'm here today to represent a small group of friends. So who are we? Um, you might know us as a team behind Django Con Europe 2013 also known as Django Circus. 
It was a conference held in a circus tent on a horse race track. It had different feel. We had hammocks, deck chairs, and very relaxed atmosphere. It felt almost like a music festival, and we liked it. We, li we liked it really, really very much. Then, sometimes later, uh, Makerland happened. It was an awesome event with robots, quadcopters, and everyday objects connected to the internet. People had fun, so did we. Part of our team organized Django Girls, and you will hear about this later. This event also had, was full of, of good feelings and relaxed atmosphere, although it was very busy. Recently, we had an idea, uh, a very nice idea. It, it bloomed in our, in our minds kind of concurrently. Let's have conference that's even more about people, even more about you. Let's go to a place where people really stand out. Let's rem remove big city, cars, noises, advertisements. Let's go to remote place, natural and beautiful place. And I know such a place. I grew up there. Here's the deal. It will be smaller, much more intimate event, focused on getting to know each other and sharing knowledge. We'll have campfire story stories, hiking and kayaking. We'll have relaxed atmosphere, much more focused on hallway or campfire track. All of this will happen in summer of 2015 in Bieszczady, Poland. And some say this is the most beautiful part of Europe. Although, I might be, I might be biased. <laughs> so, think about it as a weekend get getaway in the mountains with your favorite Python people. If that sounds interesting, go to this website and subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on Twitter. So, Python Fest, a summer camp for Python people. I hope to see you there. After Ola and Ola, there will be uh, Maciek Grika. That's you. Excellent. Get ready. Okay. There's lots of you here. <laughs> Ola, hey, you start? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hi there. You probably don't see us, but yeah, we are too short. But uh, we are Ola and Ola. And we, found, we are founders of uh, Jungle Girls. Uh, we did our first workshop on Monday, and we want to share our experiences and uh, what we have learned. Okay, so what's Django Girls? Uh, to put it very simply, it's a one-day workshop for women who want to learn about technology, start programming in Python and Django, and maybe even become pro professional programmers. We want to see more women here at EuroPython, so we've decided to de dedicate uh, lots of our free time <laughs> to help this cause. Okay, so... Uh, some statistics, um, we had more than 300 applications uh, from 33 countries. Um, so we see that there is a big demand of this kind of events and we're really, really depressed to reject a lot of them. Uh, we basically planned for 19 uh, women, but we grew to 45 overnight. <laughs> Yeah, and it was really awesome. People were so motivated that they spent 11 hours on Monday uh, of very intense programming. Most of them write the first line of Python at 9 a.m. in the morning, and by the end of the day, they deployed their application to Heroku. We were really, really proud and actually quite surprised that they managed to do that because we expected that the tutorial can be a little too much for just one day. So, yay. <laughs> okay, so tutorial. Um, we started uh, with looking at the internet and for existing tutorial, but we couldn't find the perfect fit for us. So of course we decided, well, let's write our own tutorial. So we did, and uh, it is on tutorial.djangogirls.org. Uh, it's open source, uh, it's on Git, so you can be, we accept pull requested pull requests, and of course, we are still polishing that and try to fix the bugs we discovered uh, on Monday. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we have a lot of stuff covered there. Their uh, installation of Python, Django, Postgres. Uh, we use uh, virtualenv. Uh, we go through 
Python Django models, admin views, or, or URLs, or um, templates, forms, HTML, CSS, so like a lot of stuff. Um, we have quite cool setup, so we start with uh, yeah, Python 3.4, Django 1.6, uh, and Postgres. Uh, we had some troubles. Uh, we thought that the most problematic will be Windows, but Ubuntu is much worse. It's a real mess. Uh, so we are super thrilled to say that on Monday, 35 new female programmers joined our Python community. <laughs> of course, it, uh, it, uh, all of this wouldn't be possible without the help from these awesome people. There are 15 of our coaches who spend their free time before, during, and after the workshop to make it all happen. We are also very grateful to the old sponsors. Thanks to them, we were able to fund travel for some of our attendees. And the team behind our Pythons was very generous and very helpful with organizing everything so perfectly. Yeah. OK, so here we are today. Um, in two weeks, there is next Django Girls chapter in PyCon Australia, thanks to uh, amazing Elena Williams. Uh, and then there will be Django Girls Argentina. Um, but we don't want to stop here. Um, and when we were choosing attendees for the work workshops, we wanted to uh, find people who are not, not only want, who do, want not only educate themselves, but who are also motivated uh, leaders. Women who will go back to their hometowns and do something good for the community. So that's why we hope that next year there will be, uh, we'll have many, many, many more Django Girls happening on a regular basis all over the world. And of course, you can help us make it happen. So become a coach, organizer, volunteer, sponsor, proofreader, or supporter, or even like help us spread the word and spark the change. Uh, this is our website or email, so just drop us a line and let's talk. Thank you. We're running out of time for uh, the remainder of the uh, lightning talks. I'm going to add one more, and I'm going to pull one up um, because it's about EuroPython. And even though I told them I would not, <laughs> um, I will give them the last slot. Mike Miller and Fabio, are you around? Mike, I see you. Fabio, excellent. Can you come forward? Um, yesterday, we managed to get through everything, I think, even before time. Um, today, we have a few that we couldn't get to. Everybody who wants to get the chance to slip into the first spots tomorrow before we open up, come to me and then I can transfer you to the next list. All right? So, Maciej. Thanks. So it's like a Polish uh, combo at the end, but I can't hope to top Ola and Ola. Um, so I wanted to uh, shortly show you uh, Incompadre, which is uh, something I'm working on. Uh, and just, just a disclaimer, uh, I'm, it's still a very embarrassing uh, state that the app is in, but obviously that's a great reason to show it to a huge audience of critical developers. Um, so uh, I'm still trying to finish my PhD. I did it at uh, UCL in London, and it was in computer vision. And um, after developing uh, some image processing algorithms uh, that aim to be perceptually nice, um, I had this problem, and to, to uh, imagine it, just uh, imagine for a second that you, unlike me, you're a serious researcher trying to uh, contribute to the good of humanity uh, by creating a real important state-of-the-art uh, photo filter to uh, make cat selfies more attractive. <laughs> uh, so you have this uh, new amazing algorithm, uh, but how do you figure out whether it's actually good or not? You can't actually quantify it easily because it's all about perception. Uh, so what you have to do is run a user study. And if you're like an ordinary CS researcher, you um, gently encourage your CS undergrads to be your test subjects. Uh, you take 15 of them, ask them what they think, and then you publish. Uh, or maybe you write a Java applet, or if you're really avant-garde, a PHP 4 application running on your Windows XP laptop on your desk and make it online. Um, but I really want to make it easy to do the right thing. Uh, and the right thing in the ideal world would be to, for the researcher to 
first of all, figure out what they want to find out, which is obviously the difficult part. Uh, but then once they have that, just to upload the data, run their studies, get the reports, and be able to publish. Um, so I'm partly there. Uh, it's, a, it's a Django app. It's integrated with Mechanical Turk. You can already ask people what they think. And two papers are submitted uh, using the system. Uh, but I'm not there yet. So uh, a while ago, I thought, OK, I figured out image processing and some Bayesian stats. And I even figured out how to write CSS. So how hard can it be to uh, make a usable application? And then this happened. It was like 300 form fields on a page and thousands of options. And uh, I can use it, but I think I'm probably the only one. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, show this to you. Hopefully, uh, you will tell me afterwards what you think about it. If you are a person that rocks at uh, user experience or know somebody who would like to help out, uh, please let me know. Um, and yeah, this is not even the worst part. You should see the documentation. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really curious what you think about it. So either please grab me afterwards or uh, just write me an email. Thank you very much. The last lightning talk uh, will end pretty much exactly on 5.30, uh, on 700 hours, something like 7 p.m., uh, the dinner will start. Um, as far as I know, the organizers would like to have a little bit of room in the building uh, to be able to prepare everything, and I think they want you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Can anybody contradict me or confirm me? Okay, that means that I'm confirmed by absence. <laughs> yeah, Christian says he so don't, don't, I know that guy for 30 years, so <laughs> if he wants us out, then we better go out. That's the that's wrong screen. Uh, try to dis display my monitor. Should be something such. Monitor. Um, uh, I'm Norton. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Turn it. It was on, actually. No. Okay. All right. Okay. You ready? Ready to go. So you, you managed. So, uh, the student EuroPython 2014, but people in the hallway keep asking me about EuroPython 2015, and this is this very short lightning talk is about. And uh, we have to go back a little bit in history. And just want this very condensed version of what happened in, in the past so far that might be necessary to understand what we're talking about here. So last year at Florence, uh, our proposal, the German group, the Berlin group, applied for your price in 2014 and 15 and was accepted last year at Florence. That's so far. And then a few things happened in between. We will talk about quickly, uh, though, in December 2013, the APS took this uh, your person 2015 thing away from, from the Berlin people. For some reasons, we will explain soon. And then they announced in January, your person, Fabius here, a new call for your person 15. And also the Berlin people were invited to, to apply for the conference. Uh, and the reasons will be explained soon. And just uh, the main reason, actually, uh, we don't have much time to go into a lot of details here. There will be a session tomorrow between 4 and 5.30. There will be three talks and discussions about this topic at the room B09. So who is interested, please come there. And the main reason actually is a different approach in how to organize the conference. Though that's a kind of the, the main picture uh, about it. And as I said, the lightning talk is not the right place to take, go into more detail. That's why the sessions for tomorrow, and now I would like to hand over to, uh, to Fabio. He's a chairman of the European Society, and he will say something more about this call I just yeah. mentioned. So, hi, everybody. Um, yes, we are running a call for participation for 2015. As already, Mike already said, we highly encourage the Berlin team to uh, apply and help us. Um, we um, they they organized this conference and it's really it's running really well. 
many details will be given tomorrow. Things just didn't work as, as expected from an organization point of view. And this, this as from a NeuroPython society point of view, this, is, was, this was a huge lesson, lesson for us. Um, this new organization board is quite young, and this made us um, really understand that the, the conference is getting very big, uh, and it's really hard to actually maintain the same kind of conference, the same kind of services and, and everything, and in a, in a status that the community itself can keep moving the conference. So I've seen many social uh, events uh, being organized around by local uh, organizers, and there's, there's much uh, effort to actually improve the community. And if you are interested in getting part of that, uh, our vision is that uh, the conference should change, the conference as, as a, uh, the whole environment, and the community should be more uh, active to, to keep the conference running. And we really need your help. We need your help to build a different plot we would like to uh, introduce a new concept of open org groups. So the EPS, we, we would like to change the, the concept of the EPS as a, an organization with, with a, um, just one board. We would like that to be as flat as possible and to have uh, all everybody from the community working inside open teams that want, want, will not change every two years. And for that, we really need your help. If you think that it can help, it, it can work, it cannot work, that you can help us, or that we are doing a bad job, or that we are doing a good job, you should come and, and do your best to, to, to make things happen the way you like. Because the community is all about you and, and not about the, the, the organizers itself. Thank you. All right, thanks. Get out of here. <laughs>